Well, today we are in Lesson 12. Can you believe it? We're just moving right along. Amen? And we're in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 25. Now, if you've been in the study in the book of Hebrews, and you haven't gotten the fact that Jesus is better than the angels, he's better than the prophets, he's better than Moses, he's a better rest, he's a better high priest, he brings a better hope, he's a better covenant, and he's a better heavenly tabernacle. Well, if that's not enough, today we will see in two sections, verses 1 through 25, the first 18 verses, we're reminded that Jesus is a better sacrifice because his blood is superior, making his sacrifice final. Then in the second section, 19 through 25, we actually begin the second division of the book of Hebrews today. Woohoo! We are now entering in to the phase of application, of the response phase. And we see today, as we have seen all along, that God is deadly serious about sin. Did you know that? We see that sin cannot be paid for apart from death. The wrath of God is poured out through the shedding of blood. Yet not just any blood, but as we've seen, it's the blood of his only son. If you think about that, that is the epitome of wrath. For those of you that are mothers, can you imagine that your wrath could only be satisfied by the blood being poured out of your only son. I mean, if we just stop and think about that, that is a huge thought. And it shows not only the seriousness of sin, but it also shows the fierceness of his wrath. But it also shows his unconditional, unmatched, unfathomed love that he has for his children in that he would provide that propitiation. And this week, as I was contemplating the seriousness of sin, as looking at the blood being shed of his son, and in my reading in Deuteronomy, I I realized just how much we are like the children of Israel in the United States today. Have you ever thought about that, how the United States is much like Israel? And we see that similarity because we see what's happening in our society. You see, the United States of America was founded on freedom to worship. Was it not? It was. That is the reason we were brought here, is so that we could freely worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet, because of compromise, because of complacency, because of a lack of fervor, the church, those who came here to worship Jesus Christ, society is swinging in the opposite direction. And we look at the children of Israel throughout history, we see that God's plan for God's people has always been and will always be that we would be different, that we would not become like the world. You see, the church has believed a lie. The lie is, well, you have to look like the world in order to minister to them. You have to do the things that the world does so that that you can go there and, and, and make a difference. But that's a lie. And we know that that's a lie. How? By looking at the word of God. Because God in the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, it's throughout the whole word of God, tells his chosen people, his royal priesthood that he has set apart for his purposes, to come out from among them and be ye separate. He tells us to be holy as he is holy. He tells us to be set apart as he calls us his royal priesthood. Just as in Galatians 6, 7, it tells us that we will be reaping the effects of what we sow. What we allow, what we embrace in our lives, even in our society today, will be seen with fruit. Bad fruit or good fruit. And even though this country was founded on freedom to worship here in the United States, our freedom right here in the Temecula Valley is being snuffed out. And we think it's all good because we're here. But I'm here to tell you it's not good. The California courts has decided that it's illegal for churches to be in the, in the Temecula wine country. And it's being challenged by the vintners and the wineries. Now, I'm here to tell you that the Vintners Association has made it clear that they represent all the wineries. All the wineries, okay? 
So if there's any question as to which wineries are coming against the church, it's all of them. Behind closed doors, they have told us they don't want our kind. So for the life of me, why are we giving them God's money to hire attorneys to fight our freedom to worship? Ladies, it's time to come out from among them and be ye separate. That's what the word of God says. And I can't tell you how important it really is. Now, you say all the wineries? Yes, the exception of one. And I am so blessed, and I bring this to you today because we need to be on our knees for this man. South Coast Winery, Jim Carter, has been voted off the Vintners Association board because he refuses to come against the church. Now, this man, who's a winery owner, is taking a stronger stand than many people that sit in this sanctuary. That blows me away, and it should shame us, really. It really should. Not to put a guilt trip, but what are we doing to take a stand for our freedom to worship in our own community? And yet this man is taking a stand for us, and he's having repercussions where he was voted off the board. But you know what? Praise God for that man. We need to pray for him. He even told Clark, I think I might come to church out there. Praise God, because you see, we don't have to fight with one another. We can be good neighbors. There's no reason for this. We don't come against them. They need to stop coming against us. We are the community here. We're not here for money. We're here for spiritual values and to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So it's time. It's time. Clark told me it's okay. It's time. Time to raise up. It's time to wake up, church, because if we don't wake up, we will be like Nazi Germany, and it'll be too late. It's time to take that stand because we have been given a God-given freedom. It's time to start putting the priority for living for the God, for the glory of God, taking that stand for righteousness and how we need as the body of Christ, not only individually but corporately, how we need the spirit of God to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. How we need the spirit of the living God to come upon us and empower us so that we can make a difference as we abide under the blood of Jesus Christ and he anchors us in to the Holy of Holies so that we can make a difference in the world around us. I don't real know if you realize it or not, but time is short. All you have to do is look at the news. Time is short. Jesus is coming, people. He's coming so soon. And I so want to be covered with the blood of Jesus. I so want to be anchored into the Holy of Holies that the wrath of God will pass right over me. I, it's not something to be playing around with. God's working, and I want to be on his side. I want to be a part of what he does. As he has promised us that the, land, the scepter of the wicked shall not rest upon the land allotted to the righteous. Amen? God has allotted the land to the righteous, and we need to rise up. Well, getting into ver, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, in verses 1 through 18, we see three reasons why Jesus' sacrifice is superior or better. And again, this is a review of what we have been studying. But it's because it takes away sin. In Hebrews 10.1, it says, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things. We first see the contrast, which we've seen in the past, with the law, which is representative of a shadow, in contrast to Jesus, who is the substance. Turn back to Hebrews chapter 1 as we go back. Just as Colossians 2.15 tells us that Jesus himself is not just a copy, but he is the exact representation of God. Why? Because he is God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He is preeminent. Back in Hebrews 1.3, the law being a shadow or a type of Jesus being the express image of God, we saw that God spoke to us by or in Son. Remember, we studied that. He spoke to us through his Son, which in the Greek was in Son. What is the Son? It is the Word of God. So God today speaks to us through his Word, whom he has appointed heir over all things, through whom also he has made the worlds. And then in verse 3 it says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. And when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's who our Jesus is. He is God Almighty himself. And it's only a picture of God and his holiness being the law 
It's just a shadow. So too, the outward performance of man. Anything that we can do that works towards being in a right standing with God is just that. It's a shadow. And again, we looked at the fact that who talks to a shadow? Who turns and focuses on the shadow? None of us. We all focus on the substance that's casting the shadow and that shadows disappear. So first, we revisit the contrast of the law versus Jesus. And then the second contrast is the covering versus the taking away of sin. The second part of verse 1 of Hebrews 10 says that, the law or the shadow can never with these same sacrifices which they, speaking of the priests on Yom Kippur, offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they have not ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a constant reminder of sins year after year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Now, again, we, we've looked at the fact that year after year, every time the worshiper would bring a sacrifice to the priest to offer it on the altar, it would be a constant reminder, a constant reminder of Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, where it says that God, his ears not deaf and his hands not short, that he can't hear and save, but it's our sins, it's our iniquities that have separated us from God. It's the sin of, of, of mankind that separates us from God. That's that chasm that is there, that only the blood of Jesus Christ can bridge. It reminded the believer of Habakkuk 1.13 that God's eyes are too pure to embrace or to hold or to look upon evil. So if the sacrifices of bulls and goats or earthly offerings really worked at paying the penalty of sins, they would not have needed to be repeated. And as I thought about this condemnation that it brought as they had to go to to Jerusalem on Yom Kippur with their little sacrifices, how that would bring such condemnation. Why? Can you even think about imagining the trek that some of these people would take walking by, by foot all the way across Israel to make it to Jerusalem to be able to offer their sacrifices with their little lamb, their precious little lamb that they had to feed, they had to care for, they had to tend to this little lamb because there couldn't be any blemishes on this little lamb. Because, see, the focus would totally be upon the sacrifice, this little lamb, that would be the focus. They would have to bring it in, and then only... As they approach Jerusalem, they give it over to the priest to sit there and watch the priest take the knife and slit the throat of that precious little lamb and watch the blood be drained so that it could cover their sins year after year. Can you imagine the heartache that that would bring? I can't imagine the condemnation of realizing the sin that needed to be paid for. And while it's good to remember that we're sinners, because we all are, none of us are perfect, none are righteous, no, not one. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God, the word tells us. But while it's good to remember that, today, now, as we are under the blood of Jesus Christ, we get to rather remember that the work is finished because of the spotless sinless lamb of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus at the Last Supper, speaking of instituting the communion, said, do this in remembrance of what? Of how rotten we are? No, do this in remembrance of me. And what a blessing, what a privilege, what freedom we have that we can come and remember what Jesus did. We can focus on that superior sacrifice, the superior high priest, who is not only our merciful high priest, but also he has accomplished eternal sanctification for you and I on our behalf, and it never has to be repeated. And what that means is there's no more pledges. There's no more works that I have to muster up to try to be in a right standing. No more sin gets swept under the rug. I always think of the Tupperware container when I clean out my refrigerator, when I think of the difference between covering and taking away. As I put that old food in there and I discover it months later, and you lift up that sealed tight freshness lid and you go, whoo, what in the world? You see, that's like our sin that just gets covered. That's the best that the Old Testament sacrifices had to offer. 
but man, I can take it and throw it away. The trash man takes it, and it's never even to be thought of again. And that's the difference is Jesus takes it away. So that means instead of condemnation, I now have celebration as I focus on Jesus Christ. So Jesus is superior in his sacrifice because he takes away sin, and it involves the will of God in verse 5. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, quoting from Psalm 40, a sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I, Jesus, have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. The volume of The totality of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation is all about Jesus. Do you have a hard time with the Old Testament? Filter it through the idea that it's all about Jesus, and it will become alive to you. Clark teaches the book of Leviticus over at the Bible College. He's just starting, and he loves to call it the book of grace. Have you ever thought of Leviticus as being the book of grace? But it truly is because it points to the fact that we no longer have to repeat these sacrifices and do all this work. It's pointing to the finished work of Jesus Christ and the grace that he gives to each and every one of us. So every book of the Bible could be entitled, Consider Jesus, as far as that goes. And then we see that Jesus came for the purpose of doing the will of his Father. In fact, in John 4, 34, Jesus said of himself that my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, speaking of the cross. In John 6, 38, Jesus said that he came not to do his own will, but to do the will of him who sent him. Oh, that we would have that heart to not do what pleases us, what we think is right, but be willing to take that stand and step out and do what is pleasing to the Lord. Not my will, not my comfort, but God, whatever you choose to do, trusting that his ways are higher than our ways. Back to Hebrews 10, verse 8. Previously saying, sacrifice and offerings, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire nor had pleasure in them, which were offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. And he takes away the first that he may establish, confirm, or strengthen the second in his own body. By that will, We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Again, in verses 5, 6, and then again in verse 8, we see that God did not desire nor take pleasure in sacrifices and offerings. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is if God had no pleasure or no desire for offerings and sacrifices, then why did God institute the sacrifices in the law? Well, if you had that question, I think it was a good question because I questioned that. But you see, as we think about it in practical terms, as I had to really ponder that and think, well, why would he do that? Because he's God. He could do anything he wanted to do. So why would he do the shadow to point? Why didn't he just let Jesus come and, you know, well, that opens a whole can of worms. But as I was thinking about it and thinking of an analogy, I thought, you know, it's kind of like writing a check, isn't it? You see, the check itself is a piece of paper. It's worth nothing, maybe a penny or two. It's just a piece of paper. But it's what the paper represents. In other words, the check is only as good as what is in the bank account. But if that account gets closed, then the check is really worth nothing. So the blood of bulls and goats or you could say the old bank account, merely pointed to the blood of Jesus Christ, and that bank account has been closed. But the good news is a new account has been opened, and it's got infinitely more riches in it because it's filled with the blood of Jesus, and it's been opened for anyone who will bow their knee 
to him in humility. So the old sacrifices and offerings were kind of like a promissory note for the true sacrifice that would come through Jesus Christ. So I hope that makes sense. It made sense in my twisted mind. Well, Hebrews chapter 12 confirms the fact that there's nothing that we can do here on this earth to get in a right standing with God other than counting on that bank account Jesus Christ because anything else is just counterfeit. Well, there's a new fad that's going through the church and it's kind of attached to the emergent church, but it's called the social gospel. And, and we see it all over the place where all the philanthropic ideas of feeding the, the hungry and clothing the, the clothless, I guess, and housing the homeless and, and reaching out and doing all the practical things that we can do for the world, which are good things. They are good things. Please don't misunderstand me. But they are nothing more than dead works. They're no, there's nothing more than the old sacrificial system. As Paul says, I can give my, my life to be burned, but if it's not done based on love by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's for nothing. Because you see, if it's not flowing from the Spirit, if it's not a response as we first prioritize considering Jesus, it will be for nothing. Turn to Ephesians 3, because good works are fruit that naturally, supernaturally flows from abiding in Jesus, anchored into the Holy of Holies. Because you see, Jesus is the root that produces the fruit. If I were to take a tree outside and have a ton of fruit on its branches, but the roots were cut off, how long do you think that would last? It would burn out, and it would drop off, and it would die. And it's no different for you and I as believers. If we don't have our roots, our heart, in the Holy of Holies, if we are not rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ, the fruit that's coming out of us is either going to be plastic, manufactured, or it's going to be for nothing, and it's going to die and rot. No, just as the old bank account's been closed, the new account is based on the eternal Lamb of God and the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Ephesians 3 that of the, the grace of God that's been given to believers is what he preached among the Gentiles. And he preached the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see that now, because of the new covenant, the manifold wisdom of God, as well as the unsearchable riches of Christ, might be known, now listen, they might be known by the church, notice, to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. And verse 11 says, according to the eternal purpose which he has accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Wow, what a powerful scripture. As I said earlier, if we as believers would come out from among them and be separate and live under the new covenant, the new bank account of his grace, the result, the fruit would be principalities and powers in heavenly places would know the unsearchable riches of Christ and the power of God through us, let alone the people around us. Is that powerful or what? I was blown away by that. Well, Jesus' sacrifice is superior because, number one, it takes away the sin. It involves the will of God. And number three, because it is final, his shed blood was shed once for all. And that result of his better sacrifice is that he sanctified us. And let me tell you, it was in spite of us. Notice back in verse 10, it says, We have been sanctified. This took place at the cross, and it was once for all. The word sanctification is used throughout Scripture, but every time the word sanctification is used, it's speaking of something that was accomplished through the body of Jesus Christ, and it is not a process. In fact, every time the word is used, it's used in the present or the perfect tense, meaning that it's something that happened at a point in the past with results that continue through to, to eternity. And it also is in the passive voice, meaning that it's something that we receive. It's not something we cause. No matter what we do, we cannot make ourselves more sanctified because we've been fully sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so again, the reality is, apart from abiding in Jesus, there's no righteousness because he is Jehovah Tzitkenu. He is 
our sanctification. He is our righteousness, and it's an eternal position. So we're assured that Jesus is able to present us faultless. Isn't that amazing? Because we are full of faults. He presents us faultless before a holy God, fully sanctified because of the cross. And don't um, mistake or confuse sanctification with the growth process because obviously we're all growing. We're all at different parts and different walks in our walk with the Lord. Some are new believers. Some have been believers for 30 years and some are some of us are pygmies and some of us are giants. I mean, it's just, we're all at different places in our walk with the Lord. So growth is not to be um, mistaken with sanctification. We're all evenly sanctified, perfectly sanctified, made perfect and holy positionally for all of eternity. But practically, we are all still growing and we will continue to grow as we grow in the both the knowledge and the grace of our Lord and Je Savior Jesus Christ throughout all of eternity. So, but both of them are a work of his grace in our lives. Back to Hebrews 10. In verse 11, where we see the result of this sanctification, and that is every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But in sharp contrast, this man Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. In other words, this doesn't negate what I just said about sanctification. It means that for those who are being saved, question, do we get saved over and over and over again? No, no different. For those who are being saved, those who are being added to Christianity, those who are being sanctified, those who are coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they will be sanctified at the cross and they will be added to that list of sanctification. I hope that makes sense. Then, as we've seen in past studies, we've noticed that the, the earthly priests always stood, signifying that their work was never complete. Their ministry was unending and it was routine as they never could cleanse the conscience. But again, our eternal great high priest has been seated and that signifies that his work is completed. And it signifies that the wrath of God was satisfied through the blood of Jesus Christ. And while Jesus came the first time as that innocent, spotless Lamb of God, as the suffering servant to complete the work for salvation, turn over to Revelation 19. Because often I think sometimes in the church today that our view of Jesus Christ can be skewed. You see, sometimes we look at just Jesus as being that innocent little lamb that came to give his life on our behalf, which is huge, but that's only part of the equation because verse 13 says that his enemies will be made his footstool. There is a day coming, and it's coming, as I said, very soon. And this is the day that the wrath of God will be poured out on a God-rejecting world. And Jesus will come back the second time, not as the spotless lamb of God, but as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the conquering king. And he, it will put an end to the end. In Revelation 19.15, speaking of the second coming of Christ, it says, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let me tell you, he's not a wimp. He's a mighty God, and he will have a final say. Turn to Colossians 2, because in this present age, the Bible tells us and we know that the enemy is roaring around like a, a, a lion seeking whom he may devour. Satan is referred to as the God of this age, but at best he has temporary and limited access and control. And we've seen that there's a fierce battle, spiritual battle over the souls of men as Satan will use whatever tactics he can, whatever is necessary to deceive and ultimately destroy each and every child of God through drugs, alcohol, false doctrine, apathy, compl compromise, complacency, anything he can in our lives as he deceives and blinds many to the truth. Yet you and I do not need to fear because at the cross, Jesus conquered sin, death, and the devil. Look at Colossians 2.13. 
And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, as we are anchored into the Holy of Holies, we're alive in him. He has made us alive together with him. He has forgiven all your trans trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Isn't that amazing? Do we serve a mighty God? Is our God bigger? Is our God greater? Why do we shrink back when it comes to taking a stand for him? I believe that we will all be very surprised because while it is simple, while salvation requires no works on our part, also know that it does not involve easy believism. It's not simply something that we assent to, just say, oh yes, there's a God. Because Jesus himself, and this should scare all of us to the point that we want to be anchored into the Holy of Holies. Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, 21, that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, in verse 22, he goes on and says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, they call him Lord. They even prophesied in his name. They cast out demons in his name. They did many wonders in his name. But yet, in verse 23, Jesus said, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Wow, what a wake-up call. The fierceness of his wrath. We need to be covered in his blood. We need to be abiding and walking by his spirit. Or we, just to make sure that we don't experience any of that. You see, it requires an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ, the Messiah of the Bible. Read John 15. Jesus himself told the disciples in Matthew 16, 24, that if anyone, it's open to everyone, but if anyone desires to come after me, we need to deny ourselves. Joshua 24 says, choose this day whom you will serve. Take up your cross. We need to, as Galatians 2, 20 tells us, to die to self. And then he tells us that we need to follow him. We need to walk in his spirit. As Galatians 5.16 says, if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In fact, back in Matthew 10.38, Jesus said, he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So I see a huge warning for us as believers today. And the point is, Jesus is the only one who can send, present us faultless before that holy God. No other way. That's why Romans 12.1, Paul tells us, I beseech you, I beg you, I implore you, brethren, by the mercies of God, not according to your own power, but by the mercies and grace of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It should be your reasonable response to what Jesus Christ has done for you. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Only abiding in Jesus, responding to him in a relationship will bring a reasonable response. And let me tell you, it's better to do it now than later because it's very clear as we sang that first song. In Romans 8, 2, it tells us that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, back to Hebrews 10 in verse 15 where we see the immutability, immutability of God. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and their, into their minds I will write them. Speaking of that relationship that we've been talking about and then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Praise God for that. God does not change. We've seen that he cannot lie. And now we see that he will not remember our sins because his blood's removed them. They're gone. As far as the east as from the west, just as 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess, he will be faithful. And as we abide in Christ, it doesn't mean that we will be perfect practically. We're all still going to sin. But it does mean that we will be robed with the robes of his righteousness as we walk 
and the Spirit. Again, it's all because the blood of Jesus is better. He is the new account filled with the riches of Christ, and he says it is finished. And that brings us to the second section, the second division of the book of Hebrews, which is we see that he has better, the better way. And this is where we begin the application. In verse 19 through 29, because you see, we will act on what we believe. That's just a law of nature. If we truly believe something, we will act on it. So verse 19, therefore, because of all that we've seen in the first 10 chapters, it's, we see two things that we have been given. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new, a better, and living, speaking of the resurrection, living way which he consecrated, it means that he literally dedicated or brought it to life through his body for us, through the veil that is his flesh. Now remember who the book is written to. It's written to the Jewish believers that were in danger of drifting back under the law, under the old way. And Jesus is saying, you've been given a new living way. You've been given access through the death, burial, and resurrection. And Jesus alone is the way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. In verse 21, Jesus alone is the great high priest. He says, in having a high priest over the house of God. So you and I, the body of Christ are the house of God. We saw that last week as we are the tabernacle that's a shadow. The church is a shadow that points to the heavenly tabernacle. And Jesus is over the church. We are his people. We are the sheep of his hand. Like we saw last week, he is the great high priest who has entered the Holy of Holies on our behalf. So first we see that we have boldness to enter through Jesus. And now in verses 23 to 25, we see in response to that, in response to what we have, we see the three let us phrases. If we, if we truly believe, it will, res, it will result in a response. Number one, verse 22, let us draw near with a true, sincere, humble heart. Jeremiah 29, 13, we've looked at this, not with our intellect, but with a true heart. In full assurance, complete confidence of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, speaking of a pure mind, which in our bodies washed with pure water. Now, in response to the truths that we've seen, we see, number one, we can now draw near to God in a personal relationship. Draw near to him through faith in him alone. Not faith in our faith, but faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work. And notice it says with a true heart. Not a pure heart, not a clean heart, because we can't, but truth, because God knows the truth anyway. We can't let God down, no matter how wretched we are, because his word tells us that our hearts are deceitfully wicked and, and that they're desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. He already knows that. So as we come to him, we, we will recognize that like King Uzziah did as he went before the throne of God and said, oh, I am a man of unclean lips. Take the coal, cleanse my lips. Here am I, Lord. And that's how God wants us to come to him. And that's when he will pour his grace out upon us so that we can come boldly before his throne. James tells us in James 4, 8, to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Again, only through Jesus Christ because Jesus is our better hope through which we draw near to God, Hebrews 7, 19 says. Then the second response is found in verse 23 where it says that we will let us hold fast. Let us grasp on and do not waver the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Again, if we truly believe, we won't let go or waver from the acknowledgement that our hope is in Jesus Christ. And remember again, these, these people had forgotten that Jesus was better. They were in danger of drifting. But now through the living Hope, the consecrated way in Jesus Christ, the old account had been closed. For he who promised is faithful. Remember all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, amen. And it's because they're based on his character, not mine. Aren't you glad for that? Because I am faithless. But Timothy tells me that even though I am faithless, he remains faithful because he can't deny himself. We know that 
whom we have believed, we are persuaded that he is able to keep that which we have committed to him until that day. Because Jesus Christ was faithful to come to complete the will of the Father, he was faithful to God Almighty. We know he's going to be faithful to us. Amen? So he is faithful. Then in verse 24, the third thing that we are to let us do is let us consider one another. Now, this is not speaking of some superficially, oh, yeah, how's she doing type thing. This is let us fully observe. Let us genuinely look out for others before ourselves in order to stir up or provoke love. That's speaking of that agape, fruit of the Spirit, not man's love, but only the love that God can put in our hearts and good works. So how are we to stir, stir others up toward good works in the Lord? Well, it's not according to worldly tactics. It's not according to an emotional hype or condemnation or guilt because that's just going to, again, burn out the roots and just make the fruit fall off and be rotten. But 2 Timothy 3.16 and Ephesians 2.14 tells us that it's by the word that, that will thoroughly equip us for every good work. In Zechariah 4.6, we're told that it's not by might nor by power, but it's by his spirit, says the Lord. And in Hebrews 12, 28, we are going to see in a few weeks that it's grace of God that will enable us to serve him acceptably. Well, so we are to stir up love, good works, and stir up fellowship. And this is then as we consider Jesus. You know, there's no greater fellowship than coming together and talking about Jesus. Don't you find that true in the group? It says we consider Jesus, what rich fellowship it brings. And it's lasting fellowship because it's spurring one another on. It stirs us up as we come along and encourage one another and into the unity of the body of Christ and worship through the study of the word. And we get to worship through the music and then we get to worship through that fellowship. What sweet, sweet edification that it brings and it's needed in the body of Christ. And it all stems from and flows out of, first and foremost, considering Jesus through his word. You know, the church is not a social club. We aren't to come here to do crafts and play and have jazzercise and do all these things that, that quite frankly, you can go to the world and do any of that stuff. The church only has the word of God and prayer to offer. We are not interested in competing with the world. Those are all shadows of the heavenly. We've got the substance, Jesus Christ. Now, all those things flow out of and come from, but first and foremost, we need to focus on Jesus and come together and taking the issues into the throne of God. So again, those things are not bad in and of themselves, but it's the priority is the word, Jesus, getting to know him. And then we will respond in practical ways. And why is this important? Because time, again, is what? Short. Look at Hebrews 10.25, where we're going to close with this powerful scripture. He says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. As we see practical response to all that we've studied so far in the book of Hebrews, we need to remember that the church is a shadow of, of what is to come. Now, this is a very interesting scripture because I have a lot of people tell me, you know, if I invite them to church or invite them to Bible study, their response is, well, I don't have to go to church in order to be a Christian. And you know, while that is a true statement, coming to church does not make you a Christian. And you don't have to come into a building in order to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It stops short of another truth. And that other truth is that if you are truly a believer, if you truly are a Christian, why would you not want to come together with the body of Christ? You see, this is an exhortation. It's a command for each and every one of us, and it is vital. Jesus says, I will build my church. It's his church. So really, if you don't want to go to church, you're just saying Jesus doesn't know what he's doing, and it's really not worth anything. You're really coming against Jesus. You're not coming against church. Because here, it is an exhortation. Proverbs 27, 17 tells us that iron sharpens iron, so too the countenance of his friend. We need to come together to exhort one another and to encourage one another and to edify one another. We saw when we studied in 1 Corinthians that God has placed each one of us in the body as he sees fit. What for? 
Why has God gifted his people and put them in the body? Why, if church is not important? Well, it's God's design, again, to edify one another with the gifts that he has given. And every gift is needed. And not only that, but if the church gathering, this is what really hit me, if church gathering, if the body of Christ coming together on a regular basis is not vital in the eyes of God, then we need to take out half of the New Testament Rip it out of your Bibles and just throw it away. Because most of the New Testament is pastoral epistles. It's on church order. It's on instruction on how we are to act when we come together corporately. Tell me church is not important. Tell me coming together and fellowshipping centered on considering Jesus is not important in the life of a believer. Oh, ladies, it is vital. And God commands us, do not forsake the assembling together, which is the custom of some. So the church is important, and how much more, if it's important to God, should it be to you and I as believers, especially as we see the day approaching, speaking of the great day of the Lord. So we can, as I said, we can look at the world news. I just read that part of Obama's budget plan for 2013 is to cut six billion dollars from israel's defense spending that's part that's his answer to fixing our budget crisis and with the war between israel and and iran just it's inevitable it's going to happen and it's it's coming so close so much is happening just you, you just turn on the news get on world news and just sit there and look at it open your bible and go wow 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 whoa jesus is coming anytime now i mean it's happening but while we see these things taking place, we look at 2 Peter 3.12 3, where it encourages us, what manner of persons ought you be in holy conduct and godliness? All the more as we see it approaching. Peter tells us that we are to be looking for and hastening, making it quicker, the coming of the day of God. How do we hasten the day of God? Get out there and tell people about Jesus because as soon as the last Gentile gets saved, we're out of here. We need to hasten the coming of the Lord. In verse 13, that we, according to his promise, we are to look for the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. No more spiritual battles. So we look for the glorious hope and blessed appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we wait for him to come for us, his bride. The point is if we truly consider how great Jesus is, we will respond, and that response will cause us to look different from the world. And then and only then will we be able to make a difference, not only in our own lives, but in our family, in our community, in our workplace, in our school, in our country. I mean, think about it. The disciples, 12 of them, turned the world upside down. I think there's more than 12 people here. If we would truly be set apart for his purpose and consider Jesus in all that we say and all that we do, we will be able to bring glory to God in heaven. So let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much for your word. I thank you that you have given us that provision. God, you haven't called us to do something that you, the grace of God will not enable us to do. God, you just say, come to me and you will be found. Lord, just anchor into Jesus and you will take us into the Holy of Holies. You will empower us. You will, you will fill us. You will clothe us. You will teach us. You will lead us. You will guide us. You will give us the words to speak. You will give us the actions to do. You will gift us with the giftings that we need. Jesus, it's all about you, and we thank you so much for your provision. We thank you for your love, Lord, seen in the fact that you would pour your wrath out upon the only begotten Son so that whoever would believe in him would have eternal life. God, I pray for a fresh filling of your spirit here today. God, that you would fill us to overflowing, that you would show us each individually Lord, just individually, as your spirit speaks to our heart, what you would have us to do, how you would have us to act, what places we might not should be going or the places we should be going, the things we should be doing or not doing. God, it's an individual relationship with you, and I pray that each and every one of us here would seek you first. Seek first the kingdom of God and let everything else be added. For, Lord, you will go before us and you will show us Lord, I thank you that you are alive and you have given us that new living way. It's a consecrated way. Help us to walk in it. By your spirit, by the mercies of God, we present ourselves to you. And we thank you. In Jesus Christ's most precious name.